Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Asad Lalji. Welcome to the next session of Avid Online. For those joining us for the first time, a special welcome to you. Please refer to the chat box for more information on Avid Learning and the work that we do. So now, a year and 250 programs later, including our popular premiere series of the Mumbai Opera, we can say that although 2020 challenged us in unprecedented ways, we managed to stay positive, relevant, engaged, and engaging. We have continued to champion and bring to our audiences the best of the arts and culture, supporting the creative communities and facilitating growth and dialogue within the arts ecosystem. 2021 is shaping up to be a transformative year as we continue to stay tuned and true to our mantra, as always, that learning never stops. And this brings me to our evening session to mark the occasion of National Maritime Day 2021. Avid Learning presents Indian Ocean Architecture in Bombay, a fascinating lecture demonstration on the nautical impact and influence that has shaped Mumbai's urban scape through the ages coveted academic perspectives from leading architectural, naval, and cultural historians will be discussed and diverged. Navy and maritime historian Commodore Shrikan Kesnur, who will also be our moderator for the evening, will set the premise of the session by discussing post-independence connections within the Navy and the city of Bombay. Social anthropologist Sarova Zedi will present on the architectural influences coming from innumerable trading communities from the Indian Ocean trade routes. We were to have actually urban conservationist and author Kamalika Bose speak on this topic as well. However, unfortunately, due to a family emergency, she could not make it and will not be joining us for this session. We wish her all the best. However, we have to eminent speakers on the subject and look forward to their presentations, insights, and interactions. For more about each of our speakers, please refer to their impressive bios that have been posted in the chat section. They should have been emailed to you earlier also. Please note the session will last 75 minutes, followed by a 15-minute Q&A in which Commodore will be taking questions, so please keep them posted and uh, keep posting them throughout the session. On that note, Thank you once again for tuning in. Over to you, Commodore, to level set and look forward to a fascinating session. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, once more. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for having me here. It's, it's a great privilege. And before I cast off, so to say, in naval lingo, let me just make a couple of quick clarifications. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is that whatever I'm going to say uh, or what perspectives I'm going to give today evening, are entirely my point of view and they do not represent uh, the Navy's official viewpoint in any way. Uh, second, while uh, the, the visuals I have used in my presentation, I believe that I have largely sourced them from Naval or the Maritime History Society sources. Uh, in case there is something that's not, that's been generally used, uh, they purely for illustrative purposes and not for any other reason. So having given these two caveats, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, looking forward to this very, very uh, interesting, very fascinating talk. Because the Indian Ocean, I mean, uh, as, as a person who has a bit of a smattering of understanding of maritime history and who researches naval history, uh, especially after independence, uh, the Indian Ocean stands out as a big thing. It's a cosmos that affects all of us, that influences all of us, and that's come right through uh, ages. But not having specifically seen architecture uh, from that point of view, I'm not an architect. Uh, it is fascinating having this conversation with people who understand architecture or who are social anthropologists and uh, the way they view at this. Uh, like our co-panelist who's not there, Kamalika said previously that this is a sort of topic where you can do lots of plug and play uh, at different points. And that's precisely what I'm seeking to do today uh, after I do uh, my presentation and then request Sarova to do her presentation. And then when we have a chat, uh, it will be plug and play and dip into certain aspects uh, of, of this very, very large topic. So like I have said, uh, I have called it the city of Swodam's perspective, because if the Navy is a sword, 
the Western Naval Command and Bombay where we are is the sword arm. And what I'm trying to do is sort of give a Navy perspective to the question of architecture or what we loosely call as urban scape or city scape. Now, one of the things, uh, it, would, it would probably be a no brainer to many of us to, to sort of wonder about this question does ocean influence us does ocean influence city particularly for something like bombay a city that grew by the sea an island city full of commerce full of uh, you know trade a lot of which happens on the sea yet it is possible because when you talk of mumbai these days many people will talk of railways they will talk of cricket they will talk of bollywood but very few people try and link it to the maritime aspect so I want to sort of give what might be called, as what Professor Arunachalam has written, Mumbai by the sea, what might be by the sea perspective to architecture and issues uh, that affect people. So, so to a large extent, I'm, I'm no anthropologist or architect, but I would presume that some of the factors that affect uh, the way the Navy sees and the way the Navy uh, is a part of uh, the, the urban scape is what would be concepts of functionality, memory and remembrance when we have memorials, and what we do in terms of dissemination. Now, to a large extent, this is different from others, different from perhaps those who are not in the Navy and different from the Army, because there are aspects like real estate, space. But most importantly, unlike the Army and Air Force, the Navy is heir to two professions, both noble, both long, both with lots of antiquity, which is soldiering and seafaring. So often you will find the Navy making references to both of these. And, and there will also be questions as to how back we go into past. What are our reference points, points of rupture? Do we take our, our uh, uh, sort of history from uh, our ancients, uh, our, our uh, illustrious, the Cholas, the Marathas, or go back much before? Do we take it from 1612 when the, uh, Royal, uh, the Indian Marine, Bombay Marine started? Do we take it from the Royal Indian Navy formation in 1934? So these are questions that we can discuss and see. And how do we look into the future? Now, first and foremost, and I'm flashing these two islands, the Middle Ground and uh, Oyster Rock. And the basic premise in any uh, naval view is that lots of people talk of Bombay as a secure harbor in terms of navigation, trade, but secure is nothing without security. Uh, the reason Bombay Fort came, the reason a lot of measures were taken thereafter was for purposes of security. And therefore, uh, uh, what I'm trying to sort of bring out is that the Navy plays a very distinctive role, not merely in terms of territorial integrity or coastal defense, but in ensuring trade and commerce, which is the basic functionality of a city like Mumbai. So right from the beginning, uh, security of navigation has gone along with overall security. And these two uh, buildings or islands with coastal batteries, earlier they were meant for anti-aircraft guns. And much before when they started, they had the Bandaris uh, who were there for counter piracy measures. So, so we begin with the premise of security. But in our case, security means much more than merely uh, territorial integrity. So now some parts over the next five minutes, I'll be telling about things that most historians and most uh, Bombay experts know, but since avid learning attracts lots of people, including several first timers, I thought that I must make a brief mention of our past before going on to the future. Now, so this is how it all began. We know that the Portuguese came sometime in the middle of 16th century. Then they handed over to the Brits as a part of the dowry. And then the British then subsequently developed. And it all started from what is called the Bombay Castle, which is today's INS Angre. Uh, this is how the Bombay Castle looked in those days. Now, this is how it looks today, the, the entry. This is the uh, Portuguese gate to what is INS Angre, also used to be called the Castle Barracks, a very, very important uh, sort of part of old Bombay architecture and structure that is still there. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, many of you know the Manor House, for, but for those who don't, Manor House housing the present uh, flag officer commanding Maharashtra Naval Area, uh, the, the admiral who looks after Maharashtra, uh, so to say, 
uh, uh, from the naval aspects. It is his office, and this is the first modern construction in Bombay. This is where uh, Garcia de Orta, the Portuguese bot botanist, stayed. Uh, subsequently, General Longe, the governor, stayed. And this is this is what is in many ways. Many people said Bombay began from here. So, so in some ways, uh, the growth of navy or the maritime aspect in the city is coterminous. Both of them started growing at the same time. Now, other part that is also a great, and I'm rushing through this because this is largely well known, is the naval dockyard. Uh, again, part of Bombay's history, but many people uh, in looking at the naval dockyard, look at, look at the beauty, look at the history, look at its antiquity, but they forget that this is India's oldest military establishment, started 1735, but actually activity began much before that. And this dockyard, ladies and gentlemen, is what made Pax Britannica. This is the one that sustained the empire. If the ships uh, of Royal Navy of East India Company had not been uh, built or maintained in the Bombay dockyard, if their bases were not so close by, Unlike other colonial powers, they would have never been able to sustain their empire. And we must remember this. This is, uh, in many ways, the naval dockyard's most abiding contribution, uh, uh, heritage, history, fine, but it sustained the empire. This is how it looked 300 years ago. And even today, largely, the curve is the same. Uh, it is, it is uh, by and large, still has similar geography. Uh, this is the Lion Gate, St. Andrew's Church, the clock tower. Now, let me just leap to uh, a, a dock, a Duncan dock that was constructed uh, in the early years of the 19th century. Before that, the Bombay dock was, of course, constructed. Uh, but why I am talking of Duncan dock, uh, one is that started the tradition of building slightly bigger ships. And one of the first ships that was built there was HMS Minden. Now, Minden was built for the Royal Navy, ladies and gentlemen, and it is on this ship that years later that Francis Scott Key composed the American national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, the first couple of stanzas. So in a sense, this is a, a, a ship that took birth in India, in, in, in this continent, was used by the Royal Navy and ultimately came to play an important role in America. So, so in some senses, this is again the story of seas, of oceans, is a great connector of sort of histories that overlap, that move in time and space, and then spread across a much wider geographical sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, domain or much wider geographical field. Another ship, Trincomalee, still around more than 200 years, built by the Naval Dockyard, 1817. Again, most people know it, but for those who don't, and this, this is still kept as a museum ship in Hartlepool in UK, the second oldest ship uh, in, uh, as of now afloat, which of course brings you to the question that if it can happen there, why can't it happen here? Can we not keep ships as part of our urban scape, as part of our city's history of folklore, ships that have, have, have achieved great laurels for India? And that's a question that we can do during interaction. So uh, the other sort of buildings, this is the clock tower built in the early part of the last century, but that was the original gate to the naval dockyard. The Lion Gate was after independence. And on the right is one of the uh, uh, ancient last of the uh, electrical lamps. You will notice the, the sea lions at the base, a very maritime motif. Uh, two interesting buildings, possibly the earliest in the naval dockyard, which was the limit of what was then the colonial city. And you see it is taking the curve and even now it is the same, uh, P1 and P2 buildings, uh, probably uh, built before 1794 uh, or so. Now, the important part, ladies and gentlemen, is that these two buildings were used at various times for as a sick bay for a whole lot of Britishers who had to face uh, several tropical diseases, and more importantly, as warehouse for opium, because opium was the biggest trading item, and in many ways, it's a part of the empire story itself, the connection with the opium wars and tea, all that which makes for a fascinating history. So this rather, uh, in many ways, you could call it a nondescript building, but this is what might have created lots of history or was responsible in playing a key role in history, or at least the 
maritime aspects of it. Now we will jump to World War II. And the reason I'm doing this again and again, ladies and gentlemen, is my stress is on functionality. Uh, when I spoke to Asad uh, and told him about speaking about the Indian Navy post-independence, uh, the basic idea was to say, look, uh, heritage is fine. That's great. We are proud of it. It's, it's, it's 200, 300 years old heritage. We got the best buildings. But that sort of eclipses what the Indian Navy has been doing and its connection with the city after 1947. And I'd like to sort of discuss that. Of course, um, you know, uh, uh, since no good deed ever goes unpunished, Asad said yes, but inveigled me in this lovely discussion. So I want to, however, focus on what might be called the functionality aspects rather than the uh, ornamentality aspects. And this is Bombay during World War II. Uh, World War I again played a great role, Bombay Port Trust. We, we have that memorial in Ballad Estate of its role in World War I. World War II, much bigger. And this is what, uh, you know, Commander Good says. Bombay Dockyard was full of activity. I was astonished at the scale and efficiency which reflected credit not only on the dockyard staff, but also on the planning work. Now, what it was doing was it was outfitting minesweepers. It was outfitting ships for anti-submarine warfare. So there was a great deal going on, ladies and gentlemen, in this dockyard uh, in which the Royal Indian Navy, of course, played uh, an important role. But the Bombay dockyard did much more in terms of preparing lots of ships uh, otherwise also in the war. Uh, two, uh, again, important buildings, the Dockyard Apprentice School on the left, uh, which incidentally was the first place the naval headquarters started when the Royal Indian Navy was set up in 1934, uh, now also used as Dockyard Dispensary and Dockyard Apprentice School. And to the right, you see the David Sassoon Library, which interestingly was also used for the training of the engineering mechanics or the dockyard apprentices, as we call them. Now, interestingly, again, to come back to the functionality, the dockyard apprentice school, ladies and gentlemen, today trains lots of people who contribute to the marine industry. Only about half of them are absorbed for work in naval dockyard and the rest go out into the uh, marine industry, into a whole lot of other shipping agencies and, 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 and offshore places and, and a whole lot of places where maintenance is required. So this is a very important contribution, uh, which has, again, it has both history and contemporary aspect to it, which is why I flashed this building. And this is how the Naval Dockyard looks today, continues to be busy. So I call it giving metal to metal, steam to team and power to fire power. What I'm trying to suggest is that uh, if India or Indian Navy has become a big power, grown from half a dozen sloops to, to one of the biggest navies in the world. This dockyard has played a very, very important role. It's moved from being a ship uh, manufacturing yard, which now is done by Mazgon Dock, to a ship repair yard. But that's a hell of a lot of work when you are dealing with a modern navy. Now, this is uh, as, as many people know, the Balad Pier and uh, the railway station, again, important history. You could get into a ship in London, come to Bombay, take a train to Peshawar, uh, you know, go straight away. And that is how, in fact, again, the British ruled through their people, through their political agent, through their soldiers. And at the Balad Pier, you had this entrance, the Balad Bandar Gate. Uh, which was with the Navy. Uh, it is still with the Navy, but it was inside the Naval Dockyard. Now we've kept it out. It's open to visitors. People can see there's a small museum. And it is from this place that people entered uh, or exited uh, to, to get onto ships and to train. So very important part. Uh, similar construction is there in Kochi in a different way. The Harbour Terminus railway station is very close to the port. Uh, so, so it illustrates the the connections between um, you know the sea transport the surface transport connectivity trade people movement all of that which is again an important aspect of history and uh, influence from the seas onto land so very quickly now from the past and to the present and future uh, now this is for me an interesting building the sailors institute at sagar and cooperage because the old um, you know uh, lord alfred sailors institute which is currently the uh, the maharashtra uh, police headquarters is is huge it is grand uh, it is it comes with a sense of uh, awe whereas 
uh, that of course uh, was a sailors institute then whereas this sailors institute was was built in a very interesting way now the the architect for this of course is is uh, 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 the navy selected uh, uh, iftikhar qadri one of the notable architects uh, uh, at that time but interestingly vice admiral nanda who was a cnc here in late 60s decided until then the naval sailors had no place where they could meet for recreation or to stay so so he decided that it should be a part of a outreach activity of navy that's when the navy we reaching out to the people he held concerts uh, raj kapoor hosted a concert and there was a fundraiser so it was a <coughs> delightful way in which a whole lot of city was involved and the proceeds out of that were used to build the sailors institute and if you see uh, while it is pleasing to the eye it's wonderful it's at a nice place it's green uh, it is far more austere than the earlier uh, sailors institute so so this is what i call the post independence naval architecture some of that as a part of the cityscape and with participation by city people and renowned architects uh, post independence architect it also adjoins the uprising memorial which the navy constructed in the early part of the century which sort of commemorates the royal indian navy uprising of february 1946 ladies and gentlemen it's the 75th year of that uprising and a lot of people now come to believe that initially there was of course a certain bit of reluctance to see it as anything more than the mutiny but a lot of people now come to believe that it sort of hastened the exit of british that it was an important part of the freedom struggle so this is the navy's uh, uprising museum a small lovely uh, uh, tiny nook uh, opposite the wellington museum at at cooperage i think many of you should go and have a look if you have not gone this is another contribution or aspect uh, uh, to the city scape in which the navy has been involved now remember i talked of trincomalee and this is uh, 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 i'm mentioning not the virat but vikran you know vikran uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, about keeping her as a museum ship the navy kept her as a museum uh, until 2014 before she was finally towed away and now when you have discussions about virat it it, it sort of uh, is is a feeling of deja vu that we are talking the same things but we are not able to do it now not for a moment i'm taking a stand i i i concede that it could be multiple points of view about whether a ship can be made a museum it cannot what are the pros and cons to it but the reason i mention about vikrant is it was a war hero it 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 brought us uh, the indian navy's finest hour in 71 war and there was lots of emotional involvement being not only india's but asia's first aircraft carrier so in many ways these are the sort of you know compulsions while we are able to do some in some other places we probably don't succeed as much so for some time the vikrant museum was there uh, now it's not there lots of people thought virat could be restored as a museum but that hasn't happened but these are as i said earlier some of the dilemmas or some of the problems that we have when we talk of interfacing and in which way others should take on this role now interestingly ladies and gentlemen look at this this is not any other part of the world but visakhapatnam visakhapatnam has a submarine on the beach uh, called the kursura museum and and look at what a grand site it is now visakhapatnam was a submarine city of india there are lots of places all over the world there's a coke city there's a, a space city uh, there's olympic cities so can we in india look at mumbai as naval city as aircraft carrier city as uh, uh, as a city of the swodam as i say and therefore how do we in that case embellish it we could discuss that later but this is a successful model in visakhapatnam and one of its kind in asia a uh, very successful ppp uh, partnership huge amount of footfalls and uh, now that's becoming a museum hub because uh, tu aircraft has come right opposite on the b so it's a part of the cityscape and a different way in which uh, the navy and the city authorities and lot of them have done it together the reason i'm pointing this out is maybe it's possible maybe it's doable other places have done uh, this is in goa and kochi 
on the Naval Aviation Museum in Kochi. Look at that ship, K-97. It's one of the ships that, I mean, the same class of ships that had taken part in that audacious raid on Karachi uh, in 1971. Uh, could we have kept it somewhere uh, in some of museums or elsewhere in Bombay as a fantastic outdoor installation? I don't know, but this is some part of legacies that are being treasured elsewhere, not so much in Mumbai. Uh, another interesting thing now, ladies and gentlemen, the Gateway of India has lots of connection, uh, both to the maritime aspects and to the Navy. I'll come to that in a minute. But but look at this. This is a fantastic photograph of Abhilash Tommy uh, coming after uh, completion of his solo circumnavigation. You know, this is this is a uh, uh, navigation uh, where you go alone, you sail, you don't use any machinery. You are the only person uh, on a small ship called the Madai. And he went all over the world nonstop uh, for about five, six months. He, he went from November. He came back in April. Now, when he came back at the gateway, the, he became the first Indian, the second Asian. And this is a fantastic achievement. Uh, abroad, there are K's and WAFs and other such, uh, you know, uh, installations or places named after sporting heroes. But here, could we at least have had a plaque? Could we have uh, uh, mentioned about the landing of Madai? I mean, people talk of landing of Vasco da Gama uh, in a contemporary sense. Just a few days back, we discussed 10 years of our victory in World Cup. But what about a similar, if not much higher sporting achievement adventure that this gentleman did? Again, these things don't figure. And, and, and there's a reason I'm bringing this out to say that while we are a city by the sea, there are lots of aspects of the sea that don't easily get uh, seen or recognized by, by people uh, on land, even if they happen to be in, in a coastal city. Uh, another interesting aspect, there's a ship called INS Panvel, ladies and gentlemen, a small ship, one of the smallest, named after uh, what might be called at that point of time a suburb of Mumbai. This ship, uh, did another audacious raid inside uh, then East Pakistan. Uh, look at that awards hall. Three Mahavir Chakra, five Veer Chakra, two Nausena Medan. I mean, this is amazing. Some of the best army units wouldn't have this at pro rata at less than 100 people who constituted four ships of that task force with which Panvel led. It was led by a son of soil of Mumbai, Commander Mohan Narayan Rao Saman, who breathed his last two years ago in this place. Uh, and, and one of the gentlemen, Commander Ashok Kumar, a Veer Chakra winner, is still staying in the city. The reason I'm trying to point out is perhaps, you know, Panvel could think of having a memorial for this ship. It's fantastic. The ki kind of achievements of this ship would be written about, you know, anywhere, elsewhere, with huge amount of pride. But it doesn't get the same amount of traction as some of our achievements in other fields do. Uh, there is, ladies and gentlemen, a ship called INS Mumbai. And, and this is, as I call it, the maximum warship of maximum city. This is the 10th avatar. We have had ships called Bombay or Mumbai built uh, in our dockyard. They have, they have uh, been of different specifications, different kinds. And this INS Mumbai, a state of the art, latest, it was commissioned in 2001, 2002, uh, built in the Mazgon dock. Uh, which is a part of the erstwhile Bombay dock, built in Mazgon dock, designed entirely indigenously by the Indian Navy. Again, the reason I'm trying to bring out is that while we celebrate uh, many uh, Indian success stories, the Indian Navy has been building ships for a long time, since 1960. And this is a great genuine success story that probably needs greater sort of um, uh, eyeballs and footfalls to see. Uh, so this is the Indian Navy's INS Mumbai, a very sleek, very state of the art. And recently the Navy had in, in worldly a scale model of the INS Mumbai, which has become a fairly good uh, sort of attraction for people. And then we also have the Sea Harrier Monument at Bandra Bandstand. This is a uh, aircraft thrown from the aircraft carrier. So there are different ways again in which uh, the Navy is, is sort of adding to the cityscape. Uh, and I'll come to that in a bit before making a brief detour 
because uh, uh, the lighthouse and lighthouse tourism uh, has been spoken about recently and uh, again uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, for a mariner uh, lighthouses play a very important role i mean they are, they are navigation marks they are even today even now with all technology you would wait to see it get a visual fix they form a your first introduction to the city so to say when you're coming in and you identify a city and its landmarks by lighthouses and beacons and buoys uh, so to a mariner therefore these are very important and the idea to convert some of them uh, uh, particularly the the kanhoji angre lighthouse on the left what used to be called the kanderi or canary lighthouse uh, 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 will uh, particularly now if mumbai also opens up to water transport then we can expect lighthouses to become new tourist hotspots and therefore they could also add to the uh, cityscape Uh, to the urban architecture and to the ocean influence in different ways now this is what i call uh, when we talk of uh, maritime influence we usually talk of the sea link very much contemporary maritime uh, construction but this happened 2 years ago uh, the city's new uh, engineering marvel what is called the aircraft carrier dock look at that look at uh, 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 some of the statistics there they are mind boggling um, this is this is you know it has used more more uh, one and half times the steel that is used in uh, the bandra worli ceiling concrete uh, tons of steel more than the eiffel tower and and it's amazing in different ways its rate of watering dewatering and this has been there's about 95 96% indigenous construction so while the british built great docks as a part of naval dockyard heritage the bombay dock the duncan dock it is now this is india indian navy indian civilians who built this architecture and marvel uh, unfortunately the dockyards remain hidden uh, from outside so they can't be seen but this is something we can treasure and the most important part ladies and gentlemen is that the primary contractor is hindustan construction company which as we all know is walchand hirachand's legacy so in some ways when we are celebrating the national maritime day today the 8th of april is also the 68th death anniversary of the great man walchand hirachand so i sort of wanted to show this to say that the uh, link between uh, uh, walchand hirachand and his maritime legacy and indian navy which is carrying forward that stays in many ways so uh, um, Mumbai's maritime uh, uh, scape is multi-dimensional. I agree, and there are lots of aspects: trade, uh, 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 sh the showcasing of maritime, uh, you know, objects in different buildings. I will I will discuss that during the Q and A uh, or in my interaction with Sarovar. But one of the lesser known aspects I wanted to flash a very workman like this is the naval dockyard headquarters building with those huge windows, and next to it, Bombay Dock. the one of the earliest docks that's been built and then we go on to what is my last uh, slide here uh now uh, when i say a navy that dares a navy that cares i'm not trying to do a plug for the navy all i'm trying to suggest is that when you see the gateway of india as a backdrop here uh, there are several aspects that are sort of uh, uh, fascinating connects between gateway and uh, the navy uh 4th december 1924 is uh, when the gateway was dedicated and uh, to to the country and 4th december came to be the navy day many years later for op trident and in front of this when we do our yearly concerts band concerts on 4th december uh, it is it is in some ways uh, different aspects of history coming together of course uh, the naval dock at abuts the gateway this has a very maritime dimension to it our ships are anchored in front of it the taj in front when it was attacked the navy commandos went in first there are lots of stories but we can you know talk of this as an abiding people connect and my point at the end ladies and gentlemen is very simple that in many ways uh, post independence indian navy as having won wars and having done a lot in terms of indigenization and everything also contributes in some way uh, to this urban scape uh, it interacts with people uh, but this is this is not a complaint or a lament but just just a gentle comment that if uh, the opinion shapers and influencers took a lot more notice of that and helped a bit more in gaining 
in giving traction to that aspect would probably have much more of navy in people's minds through architecture so i'll i'll end here at this point of time and uh, you know and and discuss some of the issues uh, that come later uh, thank you so much uh, thanks a lot for listening to me and i'll now uh, request sarova to come in and uh, take the baton so to say from here thank you shrikant for your showing us the world of the navy which we know exists somewhere behind some walls and somewhere in the seas but we don't really have any sense of what's going on uh and thank you asad for and i wait for inviting me um except i am not very happy with this one year anniversary thing because i would have preferred to be offline and in bombay and meeting lots of friends and people and just being in bombay right now rather than doing this talk from delhi um and uh, i can see a lot of my friends have joined from bombay and other places ajay adil ranjit and others <clears throat> but um the sadness of this life is that one has to talk about the city by the sea uh, from a landlocked space okay so let me not moan too much um, but uh, i hope uh, this uh, talk of mine will transport me back in fact i was in bombay uh in 2019 in this area which i'm going to present upon with my students getting them kind of addicted to bombay just the way i am and i know bombay people are very um turf turfy about non so to say non bombay people presenting on or talking about bombay so i want to give you my bombay credentials um so i've lived in bombay for about more than 10 years from uh all the way from kandivili to kolabat and devinagar so and kalina in the on the way um and i worked on my research on bombay for i don't think research ever ends so it's about i mean i technically started my research about for about 7 uh, 8 years ago but uh, i'm always uh, working on and thinking about bombay um it's a um, uh it's something that doesn't leave me of course uh also another thing i wanted to say i think uh, shrikant gave a few disclaimers strangely enough i can only see shrikant's name on my screen um what is this uh, should i put my own face on my screen it's kind of strange sir over here okay you're on spotlight so the rest can see you and we can oh see oh god you. okay 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 <laughs> so yeah that's it now i can see myself a little bit better <clears throat> yeah so i wanted to say that i'm a social anthropologist and that's also another thing that uh, comes with a certain kind of disclaimer because uh, there's a lot of work done by historians on bombay i feel uh, and some very interesting work um, uh, but a social anthropologist is a strange kind of a creature who lies between uh, you know sometimes collecting um, we don't really work on a archive per se but we could be generating archives where there are none uh, by that i mean uh, we collect stories from the street uh, for us the city and the material culture and the built environment becomes the archive and uh, we kind of uh, move between um, looking at what's been written historically to what's being said now uh and a lot of things happen accidentally um when we do our research there's not like some super plan that we can have except that i did have a plan and i wanted to work on a particular area in bombay i'm going to share my screen yeah so my presentation is called where there is no architect architectural histories from the other towns of bombay and there is this is a kind of a strangely controversial title uh because i teach uh now in a art and architecture school and i work with a lot of uh, architects and i speak to a lot of architects and uh, what is interesting is that one of the things that i teach is that actually cities are not built by architects they are built by people by masons by the imagination of people who move between places who carry with them design cultures aesthetics uh you know fragments of their own lives 
uh, in some uh, either a village or a different country or a town uh, and they br- be bring that into the city and i am going to be today talking about an area in bombay which is <clears throat> essentially um um located under the, i mean i know there are a lot of bombay people so i'm going to assume it's very difficult to give this talk to in like another foreign country or in uh, delhi because all the assumptions that you imagine that bombay people will have um don't work uh, so this is a talk which is based on uh yeah one second i will get to the slides <clears throat> on my work in what is uh, the mohammad ali road area so it's uh, below the jj flyover uh, and uh, uh essentially what i was trying to do was i was i mean i was living and working in bombay and passing over the jj flyover and i had a intense sense of curiosity about that place uh also because of the buildings and maybe because when i read uh, salman rushdie when i was very young midnight's children has a lot of mention of things in that area and uh, i just wanted to work on i started my work by looking at just church mosques and synagogues in the area and then of course it folded into many many stories many things that have over the years uh, stayed with me and today and it's a this, this is a public talk i'm just going to give you very simple very just blocks of things that i try to understand and unpack uh, another disclaimer i want to say is that um some of the things that i say are things which are based on uh the stories i collect my own imagination of things that what could have happened uh some readings across the archives so it's kind of a strange co- collaboration of um, ideas that then i bring together here and uh uh i hope you will like it uh one of the things i want to do is <clears throat> i want to read okay this is the area i'm looking at and there's there's no way you can look at bombay without looking at the indian ocean and i was earlier talking to shrikant and he was he's lived in half of these places on the in uh, east africa and uh, so you have to think about dar es salaam you have to think about uh, lamu you have to think about karachi gwadar yemen um and bombay of course and how these uh, places in a sense uh this is also something that happens in uh, academic thinking and i want to say this point very clearly there was a time that um a lot of uh, uh studies were done on the basis of landlocked nation states and indian ocean studies develops as a field where it's trying to say that you know you can't think uh, just as um a country a landlocked country that's not how the world actually worked and i think one of the best places to un- unpack this is bombay and uh, that's what i'm going to do today uh so as i was saying some of you may be familiar with this area you can see the Bo- uh, bora rauza there which is uh, also extremely famous in fact it is very important to the bora community because it makes uh, this is just around the time when the redevelopment plan has started this photo has been taken uh, about a few years ago and it makes bombay sacred for them it be- because it's very important for them to visit the rosa and rosa is a shrine if for those who don't understand uh, what it means uh, i'm just going to go through a set of images here from above the flyover because uh, i think there are worlds that we bypassed and uh, you know there is a theorist called paul berillo who talks about speed and his book is called dromoscopy um and uh, he talks about the fact about how we speed through places and he's of course talking about the american uh, system where you just you don't you don't even know what is going on you don't don't connect to it except that i feel that uh, the the world under the flyover is something people who have lived and grown up in bombay have a sense of relationship to this um and what is what is some uh, one of the things that i want to um, actually read out to you um and for that i will have to make my screen smaller just give me a second 
slightly nerdy of me to do this, but I thought it's nice to read it. Um, <clears throat> Bombay was an en route city. It fell on many sea routes across the centuries. Today, its archive, most strongly present in the architectural form, presents the evidence of the settlers who ranged from Bene Israeli Jews from the first century ADs to structures built by Iranis in the 18th century. A city aspired for by many and for over many centuries became a land to settle in and became the part of a new horizon. So this is a plus. Bombay becomes a settler space. It's not just an en route space. It was one of the most important ports to emerge in what has come to be known as Indian Ocean world. This Indian Ocean nest provided Bombay a form where one could move between Fatabit mosques to Mangalore roofs, Gothic facades to naively slotted, um, I mean, to things slotted as Indo-Sarsenic. Not only was the city being continuously built with the reclamation of islands into each other, but construction in the form of ports, industrial units of production, housing colonies, and religious structures were all part of what is built today as the Indian Ocean city. This making of the city and its end rootedness came to define Bombay's key motif, a city hinged on movement, settlement, transformation, and constant making. Translating literally into issues of land use, land dispute, land reclamation, colonialism, taxation, and capitalism and labor, Bombay inherited all that comes with being a port city in the Indian Ocean world. Traders, settlers, and workers from Iran and Iraq as early as the 12th century centuries settling in areas such as Mahim and Kalyan. And of course, uh, you know, there are so many evidences of this around us that we just pass by, you know, the Mahim shrine, Haji Ali, um, uh, in a sense, the uh, sect of Sufis coming in from different places, settling into Bombay and their shrines being built. And uh, I'm going to mention another uh, uh, shrine that I worked on and its relationship with the working classes, you know, because uh, it's a very different form of religiosity, um, which, um, which also I worked on. Today's local history presents them only through the main shrines and their settlers. A key change an influx uh, also happens in Bombay with the coming of Shia trading communities with the British opening the ports of Bushire and Basra. In the early 1800s, a route for postal services the British was set up between Bombay, Karachi, Gwadar, Bushire and Basra. And this is, a, this is another thing which is very interesting that uh, it becomes the post office route, right? Uh, I'm going to read one more paragraph and then go back to the presentation. <clears throat> in 1816, a traveler passing through Bombay wrote Jane Mumbai. Uh, this is a, a very interesting the book, uh, which has been uh, worked on by, uh, by Professor Nile Green. Uh, a book in which he listed different types of traders, workers, nationalities and sects who traveled and lived in Bombay. The book classified them on the basis of origin, language, religious beliefs, practices, dress, and even possible trade routes that they had taken. Working within different meters of ethnicity, religious backgrounds, sectorian alliances, regional nat national identities such as Arab, Tur Tur Turkish, Irani, Siddhi, Baluchi, Kashmiri, Baghdadi, Pathan, Khoja, Shia, Bora, Sunni working classes, um, Bombay develops as a Muslim cosmopolitan city. This is uh, again Professor Nile Green's idea. Along with this come the Baghdadi Jews, the East India Community uh, Company, and the Hindu trading communities from within the country. Innumerable Bombay gazetteer censuses were undertaken as a part of a surveillance exercise to understand who and what these communities are. And what is very amusing and interesting is that uh, um, there is uh, the the. British, uh, when they first start uh, the census, they're trying to classify the category of the Muhammadan. And they face the same kind of tension of, uh, oh, should, but these are Iranis. They say they are Iranis, but oh, they are, are they Muslim? Oh, no, but they say they are Irani first. Uh, they're from Sindh. So are they um, Sindhi Muslim? How do you classify them? And uh, this whole notion of regional uh, identities or sectarian identities like the Bohras or the Aga Khanis or the Khoja Esna Sharia Shias as they are called is extremely complicated for the British. Um, and it really kind of confuses them about how do you fix this identity. 
anyways we will go back to this uh, presentation this picture that i had left you with was is actually hajj house and uh, this was also built i think around 1901 as far as i remember um it's uh, what is called classic indo saracenic it bombay was also the city where people went to the hajj right because it was by the sea route so everybody from the country who wanted to go to the hajj had to come to bombay uh and this is in the by lanes of uh, it's um you're well, actually very close from opposite J uh, jj college of uh art um uh, and i am now thinking missing mustansir because i used to spend a lot of time with mustansir dalvi who teaches there before uh, i used to walk into these areas thinking about architectural form um yeah so this is another building which is actually a little bit ahead of dongri and reason i've kept this is i mean this building has also changed over the years is you know it has this is not it had this it has these pillars it has it had some point had uh, it has elements of deco it has of course uh, the fact that in bombay you need space so people will do extensions and what is interesting to then think is that the built environment of bombay this is another building that some of you must have seen this is actually a bohra building as far as i know it's not a jewish building uh, i'm just going to show you facades uh, of different buildings this was in uh, you can see the ornamental work here what is very interesting to think about is the idea of seepage now i'm not talking about seepage that asad talks about in his houses etc and um seepage as a idea of thinking about design you know and i think the built environments of bombay are uh, if i have to think about how design how aesthetics how buildings how architecture works it is through this notion of seepage where just like in bombay you know uh, one one of the most interesting things that i felt in bombay was that um there were people who could speak uh, marathi gujarati english hindi or they could speak to me in uh, or uh, either konkani um and what is interesting um, sometimes very strong urdu um and i think just like language works uh, where we speak in many tongues at uh, i think this that frame of architectural seepage and mixing happens in the built environments of bombay so you will see um so maybe the draftsmen uh, of who were working in jj college of architecture have uh you know they some of their designs will move into uh, will be picked up by a mistri who will use it in a building like this uh somebody else uh, will uh, uh, use uh, some something else this is this is a chalk in umar khadi uh, the reason i've kept this picture in is because locally it's called the amar akbar anthony chalk because there is a hindu building on the right as you can see there is this i'm sure there are people in the audience who will be able to sometimes suddenly tell me stories about places which even i don't know um this is a christian organization at the back and this is a little shrine and actually if you ever walk across umar khadi is a very peaceful place to walk in the evening and i think people should just go for walks there with or without the help of uh, walking tours um there's these women who sit at the back and they are um uh, tamil uh, maharashtrian and uh, muslim women who are then uh, they're putting together little garlands which are then getting distributed uh, between the shrine and there's a temple down the road so there's a very there these little places quaint places of bombay which uh, really come to you in its kind of and give you those moments of its uh mixed uh histories or what i would call the seepage or the multiple languages that it speaks back at you this is a mosque uh, built in crawford market i've kept this in because of this uh, iron work design that it has okay coming to one of the structures which um, was also built in the 1880s late 1880s this was built in the by the agha khan's grandfather the current agha khan's grandfather as far as i know and uh, this is in the heart of dongri uh, it is not a building that a lot of people access uh, of course there was also a tension with the colonial city right the colonial city is always a, in a sense the complete plan it is uh, clock towers are being built there 
and the native town is always contrasted with the colonial city you know um and there is a lot of work in this in anthropology and in history so there is a book on egypt called colonizing egypt which looks at the tension between um cairo old cairo and new cairo the colonial cairo uh, delhi of course has always had it lutians delhi versus shahjanabad and this sense of tension of constantly contrasting the uh, the colonial city as the neat and organized city uh, which is based on clock towers and time and consistent facades this is the other thing and uh, there's a fantastic book by priti chopra on this about how the british always wanted to maintain continuous and consistent facades so they were never able uh, a lot of people were not allowed to build in 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 town or in kolaba because it did not fit in with the design uh, but what i find interesting is on the other hand uh, in this area which is um, if you think of vt station as the watershed point uh, uh, this side there's a very different sense of freedom to build because you're not you're not adhering to uh, the consistency of a of a plan and yes people can say there are issues of legality illegality but i just think that we need to rethink ideas of cosmopolitanism and what is going on here so of course the aga khan builds this as a kind of a uh, saying that you know we also have see time in a certain way uh, and uh, it's a fantastic structure you can go and i have sat here with my students last year in the same space uh, there's a little shrine also to hasan and hussein inside this place mm. and it has beautiful tile work which i don't have a picture of i'm sorry um yeah so another thing that i really find exciting is the uh, work of the iranis and the relationship to the iranians of course we have a very good sense of uh, i mean the first response for us was uh, when we think of iranis is uh, of course the irani cafe and simin's work is fantastic and i think she's coming up with a book on this uh, but i also thought it would be interesting to look at um, so irani cafe iranis in that sense were of three kinds right they were the parsis the rastrians they were um, the in a sense the richer iranis and then there is a huge lot of what are called working class iranis who come actually from the bushaya port um and this is a mosque again built in uh, 1880s which i worked on it's called mughal masjid right now but it's uh, uh, it was it's also called the irani masjid mughal is the word that the british used in a sense before they used the word mohammedan um so there's some very interesting ways of classification so they wanted to put everybody into one category and all the different muslim groups in this area had very distinct identities and this also relates to about to the fact of, of where they came from and where they settled from and they maintained certain things from uh, their places of origin so yeah this is a leisure mosque it's a it's a, like a, the mosques of samarkand bukhara shiraz all those kind of places and uh, it's also changed over time i've seen older pictures of this leisure mosques are mosques which are uh, where people go and sit uh, so usually when we think of uh, mosques especially with when we think of um, you know current media projection of muslims and mosques is mosques are always seen as spaces of congregation uh, during eid and people go read the namaz and leave but because this is a, this is a built in a certain uh, way it has these gardens people come and sit here uh it has a certain kind of tranquility water in the middle of the fountain uh one of the other things that i really uh, found interesting with this mosque and i want to mention it and which i find it as a very interesting indian ocean moment is uh, the fact that they used manglo tiles eventually and i'm pointing my cursor to that uh i mean earlier it had a flat roof i've seen a flat roof picture but this adaptation you know that you this is this is the mixing of languages right where the manglo tile is then on uh tiles that were bought from bushair by the cc and it's a practical idea also in fact the manglo tile has a very interesting history in itself because manglo tiles were brought in into india 
through the Jesuits and they designed it. And uh, some friends of mine work on this in Mangalore um, and they're working on a factory there. If anybody's interested, I can tell them more about it. So this thing of the Mangalore tile, which is already an adaptive version of um, an architectural form, which then is then adapted into a mosque in Dongri. This is, of course, in Dongri. The other thing is, uh, since uh, we're in the era of um, cinema, uh, which is always uh, associating Dongri with um, the underworld. So it was very difficult for me to uh, sometimes work there because people were like, please don't pull us down to the book that has been written with the name Dongri in it. I'm not going to say the name. Um, <clears throat> uh, because, they, I mean, there are so many worlds and lives that are lived here. And this mosque also becomes the center uh, of Mohoram in Bombay. And I'm, I know this is not a presentation on Mohoram, but what is really fantastical when Mohoram happens in this mosque is that the person who used to come and read the majlis, which is the story of Karbala, he speaks, he, used to, he, he, he ran the majlis for 56 years, Maulana Athar, and he spoke the most beautiful, chaste Urdu because he came from Lucknow. The audience here were Khoja Shias who are Gujarati speaking, actually. Mm? Uh, and the built form is Iranian. So I found that extremely fascinating that how the a space then become of different languages and that generates the new, I mean, that is what I would say the generation of Indian Ocean architecture. And uh, these are just some facades. These are, I think, some of my students' pictures. I took my students to these places because, yeah, I think it's nice. I mean, here I've kept this picture because you can see the new and the old tiles, right? And I think it's okay because people have to make things survive and there is um, nothing that is done for that space. And the Mukarnas here, the oof, they are astounding, this one. And this is on a regular day. Uh, they also have a library, by the way. There are many libraries in this area which were built by religious groups. Uh, I have sat and worked in that library. And in fact, a view of the library opens to this uh, and it has very interesting books in English, Persian, and Urdu. Uh, it has books uh, on Sufism, Shiaism, Islam, history of Islam, and other things. Um, yeah, this is a Muharram is coming picture because they put the black flag here. So this uh, is something I've kept in. This is the shrine of Pedro Shah. And for those of you who have been to ED station in life or who... <laughs> have studied in JJ College or who have been to Crawford Market, you have definitely walked past this. Pedro Shah's story is, um, it's very interesting. So there is a very, this is the book I mentioned earlier uh, when I read out, this is a book by Nile Green. It's called Bombay Islam. This, what is interesting in Bombay is that a lot of books, a lot, a lot here. I, I mean, I've counted, the last count I had were like some 113 books were produced on the colonial city. And I think there are like three books on the native city. And this is one of them. And this book includes uh, a lot of uh, Safar Namas, uh, which are um, uh, travelogues of people who lived in Bombay. Uh, one of the stories in the book is uh, about the Pedro Shah shrine and how uh, close to the Pedro Shah shrine, um, and he picks up the story, Nile Green picks up the story from uh, Safar Nama. They had built a big alcohol den and the wall comes down and people say that it was the curse of Pedro Shah. Interestingly enough, I never found his story on the street or when I visited this place. In fact, the first time I ever heard the Pedro Shah story was by a taxi driver in Bombay who told me about how Pedro Shah was a petiwala. Petiwalas are people who carry these thicker baskets and they're dockyard workers. So again, a very strong connection to... So th this is the old market, as you all know. Uh, and uh, uh, they are dockyard workers who uh, carry these loads from the docks to the shops. And they are still there. 
and i'm sure people who've been uh, to crawford market have seen them uh, or around uh, so he was a pt wala and the story that i heard was i call it the story from the street which is different from the story from the book was that there was a time that he was sitting with other other friends and um somebody his boss who was apparently a parsi or someone came and said pick up the baskets and come fast and he said no we are all eating and then uh, he says no um, you have to come he starts beating pedrosha and pedrosha's name uh, is pedrosha because he was of portuguese origin apparently uh and then uh, what happens apparently is that he gets up and the baskets get up with him and this fly so the way it's described the story is that the baskets float through mohammed ali road or whatever it was called at that time uh and what is really interesting is uh, the same story i have read in mg wasanji who uh, writes about um, uh railroad workers in africa and a shrine there and how the coal my uh, baskets started to fly so also one of the things that i always feel is stories travel between oceans you'll find stories recurring across the ocean uh, especially things like miracle miracle workers etc and i found pedro sha as a very interesting figure to think of you know bombay has had a lot of um, labor history especially with the mills but to think of a labor history pre mills is what i would think of pedro sha as as a kind of a organizer um and this is a very nice place uh, to go and sit i mean i've always met uh, women who like a lot of i mean I, i i don't want to say hindu or anything but like gujarati women sitting uh, chatting here talk before they take a train to vt it's like a it's like a angan a shrine always kind of functions like an angan and uh, so and this it has this fantastic um iron work uh, thing which the earlier person who was the he died uh, i used to know him very well uh, he was very proud of this uh, metal work because um, yeah and of course these um tiles which you are all familiar with they are also in the bombay dot club right so look at how materials move it's also about how materials move what is available what the, can the uh, artisan or the craftsman or the mystery do with what he has and that's how cities are built right uh then finally i'm coming to my last piece so everybody is familiar with the kala ghora synagogue i've kept the synagogue in because i worked on a synagogue but not in town it's- in the kalakura synagogue i found this amusing that they had so many different types of kippa um and there is a huge look at the these ones and look at the in like kind of like the muslim skull cap and all kinds of kippas i would say uh this is of course the uh synagogue in Kul, uh, in fort uh, sorry in kalakura but i worked on this synagogue which is the samuel devaker synagogue and also it's called the yahudi masjid uh this is a very cop- i mean most people know the story of why it's uh, masjid station is called masjid uh, masjid station is called masjid because uh, it gets its name from this and yahudi masjid means mosque yahudi means jewish so it was it is locally known as the jewish mosque um uh, the bene israeli community um is uh, older and larger than the baghdadi jewish community in bombay uh, they are more uh, they they have taken the story in the archive now this is one of the times that i did go into the bombay archives goes that in uh, around the 18 early late 1700s uh, early 1800s a uh, british uh, priest sees people in alibag who are practicing um shabbat they are uh, doing kosher but they don't have the book so they had lost the torah the book right and he invites a rabbi friend from the uk to come in from england to come and see them and meet them and then they are recognized as jewish so this synagogue um, is where i spend a lot of time and it has a very different sense of identity 
uh, everybody speaks marathi uh, the torah is also available in marathi the uh, they sometimes don't really mind using the muslim skull cap so this identity is very fluid it's not so fixed of course now uh, with the coming of the american jewish influences and singular identities things have changed and what is interesting is this is all in continuation with uh, the shia area uh, this is the tantanpura synagogue which is actually just like you enter from dongri you go towards the um, khoja mosque and then you hit on the right you go and this is the tantanpura synagogue oh and thank you so i finished right on time no so i just wanted to end uh, by saying some things and um uh, which were i think what i find interesting is to move between uh these uh, the way the city is built uh beyond um or i think the way the city the city seeps in the sea and the worlds of the sea and different people places languages aesthetics uh and it generates uh, a new world a new cosmopolitanism which is uh, you know based on the imagination of what i would say masons traders design ambitions materials and trade routes so yeah thank you i think now i will say thank you thanks thanks so much sarovar uh, uh, i think uh, the fascinating part was the way we we plugged and played from two continuously uh, two uh, contrasting different uh, sort of domains and uh, but if you see by the questions there's lots of them so there's lots of interest oh my god oh my you god there's lots of navy questions so i think you no should... no no uh, the navy questions i'll 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 take some of them i'll i'll begin with with one of the questions that that uh, professor radhika sheshan has asked you uh, which is which is that uh, you know and and i'll uh, add a bit of mine in that uh, she asked that cosmopolitan cultures are reflected very well in architecture no questions about that but could you expand on the theme of workers in the building of these monuments and i think you brought that out very well when you said that um, the buildings are not so much built by architects as they are by masons people who travel take ideas from lots of places and and i think uh, from what i know a whole lot of mumbai's architecture with its uh, the haji ali or gateway or police headquarters is a combination of multiple influences you know uh, uh, the gpo for example takes from my place bijapur the golgumas the dome, oh. the dome. and and but one of the fascinating thing again coming back to navy is that the duncan dock which i mentioned about uh, because they had lots of problems building the bombay dock they took lots of local expertise in building the duncan dock and that's how duncan dock became much better so so uh, basically how do these local influences come up you, can you expand as as uh, professor radhika says on the theme of workers in the building of these monuments i mean and are grand edifices built by a whole lot of people other than the architects uh, can you take on that and then i will answer i think uh, it is very important to think about a uh, workers and labor and masonry when we think of a city like bombay uh, and also of course engineers which come with the you know with the british uh, city uh, colonial city and i think uh, the reason i'm mentioning this is um, you know one of my favorite authors is finbar barry flood and he speaks uh, he speaks many times in bombay actually and uh, his uh, and i think ranjit also talks about him sometimes uh, so when we when we think of us when we see a uh, building and i showed you many buildings which you might have walked past uh, Uh, we see it in kind of its final form but the there are so many aspects that you will see that uh, what masons do is what is available what material is available see the other thing in the buildings that i worked on was that some of them were built incrementally uh, and not built in this kind of super planned way like uh, like some of the colonial uh, era buildings right uh but even in the colonial era buildings there is an influence of aesthetics that comes from those who build and what their what is possible in what stone right how, uh, how you can carve certain things in one particular kind of stone and how you may not be able to carve in it uh, another other another thing uh 
And I think that notion of materiality, forms of making, forms of masonry, uh, money, uh, and the uh, uh, you know what kind of money was being put, you know. So the traders who are putting money in building mosques and synagogues, etc., in the native town versus the amount of finances that are coming to make bigger structures in the colonial city will always have a different uh, sense of finish because um, they are not working under certain kinds of compulsions, right? Uh, and or even if even even I would say I, I, it's not so absolute. Uh, what 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 can you replicate from uh, you know gothic in indian stone right what can you not what are the kinds of draftsmen and masons that you have and i think that uh, is a question um, okay i don't know if i'm answering your question i'm going to read your question again <laughs> um, but could you spend more so i think i'm kind i kind of have said something about yeah, a point of comparison that I have is the early calligraphy of the Qutub. I'm really not the person to uh, um, say anything on uh, Delhi early calligraphy of the Qutub. Though I would say that what is interesting in the early calligraphy of the Qutub is sandstone and how they adapt calligraphy to sandstone, which has done a lot on marble before. So, uh, or on embossed um, uh, tiling work. So, they, so there is some connection to what you're saying, Dr. Radhika. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Any, uh, should I answer other questions? Uh, uh, Sarovar, I'll just, you, you could meanwhile look at, look at uh, some of the questions that you have been asked mm -hmm. while, while I sort of try and answer the questions that have been asked of me and then, and then I'll, I'll hand back to you after mm -hmm. a couple of minutes. Uh, I think uh, most of the questions that come my way, I, I, the point is sort of very well made, is is how does, you know, the uh, is there a case for Navy to engage itself uh, with, with the city more uh, uh, vibrantly in a different manner? How do we sort of cross that? Uh, many people feel that there is a sort of uh, cantonment curtain between the Navy and the city. And I think that point is, uh, very, very well made. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Ranjit Hoskoti also makes that point. Uh, I, uh, I would, you know, say in my defense, one is that the basic way in which the Navy is structured, what we call it the silent service, is that you can't really see the Navy in action. You can see the Army, you can see the Air Force, you can see planes, you can see troops, but you can't see what the ships do out at sea. And what they do at harbor, you can't replicate what is done at sea. So, so there is, in a sense, uh, an in, in, in inability to see much of what we do. But having said that, I think uh, having tackled uh, our own birth banks, so to say, over the first 25, 30 years, in the last few years, the Navy has made a lot more efforts, the setting up of the Maritime History Society for academic collaboration, the National Maritime Foundation, our participation in the Kala Goda Festival, uh, regular heritage walks that we do in the naval dockyard. Uh, it used to be a monthly affair and more regular uh, during the Navy week. A uh, lot more. Uh, I, I agree that perhaps we need to do many more concerts, but we are we're spreading out those band concerts and interaction. Uh, uh, there are there are a lot more academic events and, and a lot of people like me, Commodore Johnson, uh, uh, many of who are interacting with uh, with with. Uh, uh, academic communities, institutions outside. So I think a beginning has been made and, and probably we can do a lot more. In fact, this, this uh, reaching out through the cityscape, through, through installations of ships uh, is, is another way. Uh, setting up of a museum or a viewing gallery as we have been in most other places, we could do it here. So yes, uh, the point is well taken. Uh, I would like to see as a cup half full but, but uh, certainly it's, it's an important point. Uh, the next very small point someone has made out is uh, importance of National Maritime Day, uh, this session. What is the significance of such days of the continued celebration and given? Uh, I, I'll, I'll answer it very, very simply. Yesterday, uh, a couple of days back when I saw uh, the uh, McMillan and McKinsey building that's in Ballard Estate, when you see the postal address, uh, it, it is fascinating. It says Macklin and Mackenzie building, Walchand Hirachand Road, Ballard Estate, Fort Mumbai. 
Now, of course, some people may quibble that it's on the Shapurji Vallabhdasji road, but but this is a fascinating address because for much of history, uh, the the people in Macnan and Mackenzie fought Walchand Hirachand for for uh, steamer passages, and and because of which we celebrate the National Maritime Day when SS Doherty sailed out. So today, there's supreme irony when the address of Macnan and Mackenzie is on Walchand Hirachand road. But more importantly, all of them have maritime heritage. Macnan and Mackenzie, Peninsula and Orient, Walchand, Hirachan. Ballard Estate itself is completely a maritime construct, you know, the, uh, with the starting with the Bombay Fort Trust in 1872 and the entire sort of surroundings there uh, with, with motives, maritime motives. And Fort, again, very maritime and Bombay, maritime. So, so, so in, in a sense, these address signifies that. And I think uh, National Maritime Day is a way to celebrate, as Sarovar says, uh, different dimensions of our maritime past, present, and future, and the interconnections. I think Walchan Hirachan was also a person like that. Narata Murarji was like that. It's, it's about the Indian Ocean community and the cosmopolitanism uh, that is engendered by all that. Uh, Sarovar, over to you for the yeah, next. Yeah, there is so much. Oh my God, I am like bombarded. First of all, anonymous attendee, I don't know who you are and I don't like answering questions to people who are anonymous. It's not done. Huh? But anyways, I will tell you, of course, there is a uh, uh, huge amount of work uh, that has been done on thinking about uh, Chinese opium trade. And if you want, another Delhi person has written this book, which I have kept, Opium City by Amar Farooqi. Uh, a lot of this book actually goes into uh, Amitabh Ghosh, yes, Amitabh Ghosh's work. Uh, and yes, Bombay has been built on opium money. So I think all the big buildings which turned out to be solid good structures <laughs> because they had so much money <laughs> were built by opium money. And the book for this is this, Mr. JJ. So this, uh, well, one of the books is this that you can look at. It's uh, JRB GG Boys, Bombay Vignettes. Uh, by Murli Ranganathan. This is not the same JJ, yes, sorry. Uh, I bet I get confused because there's so many JJs. Um, so this is another book that you can look at. Then, of course, there's this fantastic book by a set of friends uh, called Prashant Kadambi, uh, if you want to look at. Uh, for This is for anonymous attendee. I shouldn't be doing all this for you. But, uh, okay. Uh, I What are the effects of Kohli community on Mumbai's architecture? You know, this is something that we need to study. Uh, especially uh, look at all the villages that are there and how they are organized and how they built on the basis of their use uh, as a community which is connected to the sea and fishing. Uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> I did not mention a lot of the things that I had spoken to Srikant about, which were like the Daos and the jetties and all the other kinds of uh, things that pirates also that go on in Bombay. Uh, uh, Ranjit, your point on Mangalore tiles, I partly agree with you, but partly it's uh, this this one stream of it as far as I have traced. Uh, but yes, you are right on the Protestant Basin mission, but there is one factory that these Jesuits got involved. Anyway, so this is... I don't know. These are all complicated people. Anonymous attendees for you. Nile Green's book, Madhumati, is uh, Bombay Islam. You, you can find a PDF somewhere. But if you want to buy the book, it's available. Uh, also, the books from this are, of course, you should read Kaiwan's book, uh, which reads with one part of this area, which is Bhuleshwar. Uh, question for Sarovar. Uh, Workers' question I've answered, Anusha. Yeah. Oh God, so many questions. Yeah, I think, uh, Sarovar, as as uh, Asad says, we we probably could have a uh, uh, Indian Ocean Architecture 2.0 and and call you. For that, back. I am only going to do it when the <laughs> pandemic is over, and I am coming to Bombay. I am not doing it sitting in Delhi. Or, or I give you that building you wanted in in Dongri. I yeah. want a building in Dongri. You want to also a building in Kaf Parade while well, you're at it. Um, that, that, uh, no, I know the real estate. will give you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Srikant, you can get me one in Devi Nagar also. Um, I really don't mind. I really did leave a house there. Okay. Anusha, call. Uh, yes. Um, uh, I could help you. Uh, uh, the 
you will have the Jews of Bombay. There's a lot of work done. A lot of funding does come for it in from because of the American Jewish communities uh, and the Baghdadi Jews. But I worked on the Bene Israelis, who are actually, in a sense, the most middle class and the poorest Jews. Uh, so story of how the you know the story of the Samuel Debakar synagogue. Uh, well, it was actually. I mean, what I have heard is. Uh, Samuel Devakar was apparently, uh, this is uh, apparently Tipu Sultan's mother gave him a Jagir uh, because she said, you are people of a book. And then he got it here and built this. And of course, yes, I did not even show my Siddhi work. I did, you, uh, there is a Siddhi shrine in, um, uh, in uh, opposite, in fact, uh, Mughal Masjid, uh, where we, I used to go and uh, the Siddhis, are also very, um, uh, you know, they're part of uh, drumming cultures, etc., of uh, shrines in Bombay. Uh, I'm sure uh, Asad has a whole talk lined up on the cities. We, yeah. we, we do, yeah. in fact, Sarovar, we have a whole uh, series on, on urban legacies looking at the Jewish uh, community, mm -hmm. looking, which we did uh, uh, a couple of weeks back. We have one coming up on the Iranian. Uh, community and also on the Portuguese. So lots more, lots of overlap and synergies. Okay, but I, I, can I, may I request uh, Commodore uh, K. Snow to, to wrap this because I think we are over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me read all the questions. Oh my yeah, God. No, Sarova, when you come back to the next then, one, to make you answer them. Sarova, they'll send you all the questions. Don't worry with your details and, and you can you can answer them. You, you're obviously very, very popular. There are lots of questions for you. So, so okay, no, 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 I don't yeah, just, just okay. lean back and, and you know, it's done. Huh? Thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank no, you. Not, 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 not done still, but but uh, uh, Asad, thanks, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. It was wonderful talking. We wish we had a lot more time, uh, but as we say, Indian Ocean is huge, and so the histories, stories, myths, legends, lots of that. Uh, sailor boys deal with some of these stories which are partly true, partly sort of uh, legends, and many of them abound in Mumbai too. Make, maybe we could do some other sessions on them. But it's been fascinating having this exchange. Uh, if I have not been able to answer some of the questions, I have given my email. I'll be happy to take them on later. And so I'm sure with Sarova. Uh, we'd like to thank Avid for giving us this great opportunity. Uh, and, and the Indian Ocean is vast. We've just done a very narrow dip today. But we hope to do more such dips in the future. Thank you. And over to you, Asad. Thank you so much uh, for this interesting session and sharing such interesting historical and cultural insights and perspectives on Bombay. And you know, also for stepping in, it's unfortunate uh, Kamalika couldn't join, and we wish her all the best. Um, uh, but uh, Sarovar and, and, and Kopandar Kesnu, I mean, you know, you all have just stepped up to the plate. And I wish we had a three hour session where we could actually you know, go through your presentations at, at a decent pace. And then, um, but anyway, um, uh, there's lots more interesting programs, as I mentioned, uh, you know, with Avid, we've, we've had this romance with Bombay or Mumbai, and we've had our series called Multipolis Mumbai. I know, Sarovar, you've been part of it in, in the past, which we had 57 episodes of it. Uh, when we did it in the, in the old normal, which was we actually sat on the stages of the NGMA and had conversations. Uh, but this is a new world, and hopefully we'll be back to that. Uh, otherwise, we'll have a hybrid mix of both. Um, our next Next session is on Saturday. It's a sketching and book illustration workshop uh, for kids uh, called Coral Woman, uh, followed by um, an, uh, an introduction to Indian miniature painting by Suresh Chabria uh, called Painted Delights. Uh, there's many more programs, including a new series we're launching called Cultural Capitals, which will be looking at the future legacies of Indian cities. And we're going to start off looking at Hyderabad and move to Jaipur, Ahmedabad, and so on. Uh, to find out more, just follow us at Avid Learning or check out our website. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember that learning never stops. Thank you very much. It was such an interesting and enjoyable session. Thank you, Sarovar. Thank you, Commodore. Thanks. Good. Thanks. Uh,